Hi, this is Dr. Hale. Welcome to LED 3320. Um, so right now I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking with you about informational books or what we have traditionally called nonfiction. Uh, but we're, we're talking specifically about informational books right now. Um, so what we know is that the majority of children's books that are published each year tend to be informational books. Um, and we also know that they've come a long way in the last 50 years. Um, this, the, the informational books that are coming out today look nothing like the informational books that came out when I was a child. The reason informational books and nonfiction books are so important to us as teachers is that nonfiction allows us to individualize choice reading better than any of the other genres we've studied so far or will study in class. That's because um, we can better match kids to their interests using informational books. If you think back to the primary and the intermediate interest inventories that I shared with you, uh, remember that the, the goal um, or the rule of thumb for those interest inventories was to get as specific an answer as possible from the student. So if they said they liked sports, we wanted to know what kind. If they said football, we wanted to know who's your favorite team. If they said the Texans, we wanted to know who their favorite player was. Um, and th that's what allows us to individualize. I may be a Texans fan. You may be a Dallas Cowboys fan. So for me, my teacher might give me a book about the Texans, and for you, a book about the Dallas Cowboys. That's what I mean by it allows us to individualize. So there are a number of criteria that we need to use when we are evaluating informational books. Some of these criteria are specific to particular types of informational books, and I'll let you know which ones as we get there. Um, so the first criterion you want to look at um, is the author's qualifications. What makes this author credible enough to write an informational book about this topic? A uh, couple of ways you can find out. You can look at the author's uh, biographical information in the back of the book. If it's a hardcover book, it appears on the back dust jacket, that back jacket, jacket flap. Um, you can also look up information about the author online. You can also look to see what kind of, uh, where their expertise comes from. Does it come from an advanced degree in that field? Or does it come from years of experience in the field? Okay, that's the first criterion. What are the author's qualifications? Next, you want to make sure that the facts are accurate. That does not mean that you have to fact check the entire book. We are kind of living in an age of fact checking, but that's not what I mean here. What I mean is you want to look at the copyright date. So for example, if it is a book about uh, the planets, you want to make sure that it has a pretty recent copyright date. If it has an older copyright date, um, there's one planet that is no longer classified as a planet based on more recent research. So you want to check that copyright date. Um, and another way you can make sure that the facts are uh, most likely accurate is look at the list of references at the back or the bibliography. Sometimes it's called the bibliography. Look to make sure that there are some citations in that list of references or in those that bibliography that are um, from the last two years. Okay? That shows you that they have kept the information up to date by including some more recent references. Another criterion you want to look through the book and make sure that it is realistic. We don't want our students to walk away from reading a book about pilgrims thinking that the Mayflower was like a cruise ship. Okay, um, thanks, Thanksgiving books are a great example here. You want to make sure that when you're sharing um, informational books with kids that they portray the real Thanksgiving, if it's an informational book about Thanksgiving. If it's a picture storybook, that criterion doesn't necessarily apply, but if, if it is an informational book, a nonfiction book, it needs to be uh, realistic. The next criterion. You want to make sure that the facts are clearly distinguished from the theories. 
This is because kids don't always uh, understand what's real and what's not. So a good way to evaluate this, to scan for this, is to look for language like we think for um, theories versus we know for factual information. Next, you want to make sure that stereotypes are avoided um, and you want to make sure that they are avoided in the text as well as in the illustrations. You should be able to see that there is diversity represented in terms of gender, race, age, and other categories. Um, next criterion, you want to make sure that significant details have not been omitted. You may not always have the complete expertise for this, but as best you can tell, make sure that big, there aren't big gaps in the information. Um, next, you want to make sure that differing viewpoints are presented. Again, we're talking about informational books here, so they need to be providing children, readers, with the information that is available. These are, we're not talking about reading editorials or persuasive pieces. We're talking about reading informational books. So differing viewpoints should be presented. Think about the different theories that exist about what happened to the dinosaurs. All of those theories should be presented. Um, if you're looking at a science book, a book about a scientific topic, you want to make sure that there is no anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism, if you're unsure what that means, that is when uh, we portray animals, plants, or objects as having human qualities. The reason we want books to avoid, informational books specifically to avoid that, is because it might become confusing for our younger readers. If they see animals, plants, or objects, in an informational book as having human qualities, that might, that might cause some confusion for them. Next criterion, you want to make sure that the book has answers to the typical questions that a kid's going to ask. You know, let's say you're reading a book about astronauts and how they survive, how they function in space. You can bet money that there's going to be some child in your classroom uh, as you're talking about spacesuits and uh, the lack of gravity, there's going to be some kid in your classroom who asks, how does an astronaut use the bathroom? Make sure that the book answers those kinds of questions, all right? Um, next up, you want to make sure if it's a book of experiments, that the experiments lead to an understanding of science. What that means is it should guide students through the scientific method for the different experiments. Um, not just a recipe of steps to follow, but using the scientific method. Um, and next, you want to look at the format that is available for student reference work. Okay, what features are included in that informational book that will make it easier for kids to use it for reference information? So for example, you would look for a table of contents. You would look to see if the book uses subheadings, which help guide kids to find information as they're skimming through the pages. You would want to make sure that there's an index in the book. It's often much easier to find specific information by using the index as opposed to the table of contents. Um, you should also look for a bibliography or references. Um, the best informational books are going to have two bibliographies. They're going to have a bibliography of adult sources that the author consulted in researching the book. Um, and then a second bibliography that contains a list of similar books that um, kids or the target readers would enjoy reading. So if you want more information about this topic, you might look at this book. Um, so let's talk about what kinds of informational books are popular with uh, children. 
So the, uh, the one most popular nonfiction or informational book in elementary and middle school libraries is the Guinness Book of World Records. It is the most circulated. What I mean by that it is it is the most checked out from school libraries. The Guinness Book of World Records looks very different today than it did 40 years ago. 40 years ago, it was a black and white mass market size paperback. Um, today, it is an eight and a half by 11, so a full size, uh, full color, glossy pictures book. Um, it's always interesting to find out from you all which page you like to turn to first. I always like to, and I've done this ever since I was a kid, I have always uh, turned to the page uh, for the person who holds the record for having the longest fingernails. That's where I go first. Um, and that, that entry has changed over the years. Um, the most circulated type of nonfiction book are how to draw books. So books that show students how to draw. They don't necessarily explain it um, with words, but they have kids draw this, now draw this, now draw this. Um, one of the most popular authors of these how to draw books is a man named Lee J. Ames. Here's a picture of one of his books. His books are all titled about the same, how to draw 50 this one happens to be cars, trucks, and motorcycles. I've seen how to draw 50 monsters, how to draw 50 um, princesses, how to draw 50 all kinds of things. They get checked out all the time. Um, there's not necessarily a ton of information in there that kids read. Mostly they're learning how to emulate um, Lee J. Ames' drawing style. And he's not the only one who writes them. He just tends to be very popular. So again, the most circulated type of nonfiction. Some other authors who write informational books, uh, Gail Gibbons. Gail Gibbons tends to write for younger children, so primary, pre-K through like second or third grade. Um, here's, here's a picture of one of her books from Seed to Plant. I like using them also with older kids who are second language learners because as she explains this information on her illustrations, she labels all of the different parts. So it's a great way to build vocabulary with young children as well as with second language learners. Seymour Simon is a prolific author of informational books for children. His books are known far and wide for the beautiful photography that he includes. Um, he writes books, these informational books, about all kinds of different scientific topics. Russell Friedman, um, he's written lots of different informational books. Uh, he's also written um, a number of biographies. Uh, his books are usually aimed at older students, so middle to high school students. Um, and he is known for being an intense researcher. He's really raised the bar um, for other authors in terms of the amount of research they need to put in uh, when writing an informational book for uh, student readers. David McCauley, another great writer of informational books for students. Uh, he's known for this book right here, The Way Things Work. Uh, but he's written several like this called Castle, um, and he, uh, he was trained as an architect, and so that's the expertise he brings to bear uh, on the field. So before we finish talking about informational books, I have to mention sex education books. This is where they fall. They are considered informational books, and so when children are looking for them or parents are looking for them in the library, this is where they're going to find them in the nonfiction section. I'm not uh, advocating for you having them in their room, in your room, but I do want you to know they come two different ways. There are some that are illustrated in a very cartoon fashion, and others that are uh, illustrated um, with realistic pictures. So when parents come to you for recommendations, the best that you can do is let them let them know that there's two different kinds that they might look for. Some cartoonish, if they're more comfortable with that, some more realistic. A couple of examples. Um, on the left, you see what's in there, all about before you were born. This is by an author named Robbie Harris, who has written a number of kind of sex education books. 
uh, for kids and their parents, all illustrated, as you can see, in this kind of cartoon style. And then on the right, you see one that's uh, illustrated using actual photographs and images.